let's talk about the conservation of energy. First, before we do any examples, let's discuss what a conservative force is. In simple terms, if the work of a force is not dependent on the path it travels, but only on the initial and final positions on the path, we can say this force is a conservative force. If we use examples, this makes more sense. So let's say we have a box. When we push this box, there is a frictional force. The longer we push it along the path, the work done by friction gets bigger. And if we push it for a short time, the work done by friction is smaller. So since it's dependent on the length of the path, that is a non-conservative force. Now let's say we have a particle like this. There is a weight to this particle, which is mass times the acceleration due to gravity. Regardless of the path this particle takes to go from the top to the bottom, the work done by weight is only dependent on the initial position and the final position of the particle. Another conservative force is the work done by a spring. The work that's done by the spring force is only dependent on the elongation or compression of the spring. Those are conservative forces. So we talked about the conservative part, now let's talk about the energy part. Energy is basically the capacity for doing work. We should know that kinetic energy is the work that needs to be done if we want to bring a particle from rest to a certain speed. What we need to talk about is potential energy. Let's say we have a particle like this. Let's draw a reference line, also called a datum. Now if we draw two other lines, showing two different positions like this, we can say the potential energy of the particle is weight times the distance from the datum. Another way of saying this is that the potential energy is a measure of the amount of work a conservative force will do when it moves from a given position to the datum. In this example, this is gravitational potential energy which we will write like this. There is something important to note here, which is knowing what positive and negative potential energy is. If the particle is above the datum and it moved down towards the datum, the work done by weight is positive, which means if the particle is above the datum, the potential energy is positive. Now if the particle is below the datum and is moving towards the datum, the work done by weight is negative. So in other words, if the particle is below the datum, then the potential energy is negative. Lastly, let's discuss elastic potential energy. When a spring is extended or compressed a certain distance, the elastic potential energy can be found using this equation. K is the stiffness of the spring. And now for the big equation which is called the conservation of energy equation. So we have the initial kinetic energy plus the initial potential energy of a particle which is equal to the final kinetic energy plus the final potential energy. Kinetic energy, which we covered in the previous video, is half times mass times the velocity squared. The potential energy is either gravitational potential energy or elastic potential energy. Now we can start doing some examples to figure out how to use this equation. Let's take a look at this roller coaster problem. We need to find the minimum height of the initial hill so that the roller coaster makes it through all the other loops. We also need to find the normal force on the car when it's at points B and C. What we will do first is figure out the minimum velocity required for the car to make it through loops B and C. Then we can use those values to figure out the height required. We need to consider normal acceleration in this problem since the car will travel through loops. So we can actually write an equation of motion for the normal axis. To visualize this, let's draw a free body diagram when the car is at point B. So we have the car upside down and we have the tangential axis and the normal axis. The normal acceleration is straight down since it always points towards the center of the curve. We also have weight and the normal force. So our equation of motion looks like this. If you don't remember, normal acceleration is the velocity squared divided by the radius of curvature. Now, let's assume that at this instant, the car is just about to leave or fall down. What that means is, at this instant, when the car is upside down at the top of the loop, the normal force is zero. So let's consider loop B first. We know the radius of curvature, which is 7.5 meters, and remember, the normal force is zero. So we can solve for velocity. This velocity we found tells us the minimum velocity required for the car to stay on the track at point B. Now we do the same for loop C, which has a radius of curvature of 5 meters. So again, 
the velocities we found show the minimum velocity required for the car to stay on the track. If the velocity is less than that, the car will fall off. Now we can switch to conservation of energy. We will establish the datum at the ground level and assume the minimum velocity required at loop B. So we're looking at the car from points A to B. Let's start from the left side. We have the kinetic energy of the car, which has an initial velocity of 3 meters per second. Then we add the potential energy at the top of the hill, which is mass times gravity times the height. On the right side, we have the kinetic energy at point B, which is half times mass times the velocity at point B squared. Remember, we found that before. Then we add the potential energy. So that's mass times gravity times the distance from the datum, which is 15 meters. Let's solve for height. Now we need to check something. If we choose a height of 18.29 meters, we know the velocity at point B will be 8.577 meters per second. Is that enough to get us through loop C? So to check, we will write another equation of conservation of energy, this time to figure out the velocity at point C. I will explain why we do this after we find the value. On the left side, we have the kinetic energy at point B, which is half times mass times the velocity squared. Then we add the gravitational potential energy at point B, which is mass times gravity times height. On the right side, we have the kinetic energy at point C, which is half times mass times the velocity at point C squared. Then we add the potential energy at point C, which is mass times gravity times the height. So let's solve for the velocity. We get 13.1 meters per second. Remember before how we calculated the minimum velocity required at point C for the car to not fall off? That was 7 meters per second. Well, we definitely see that our velocity at point C is much faster than the minimum requirement. So we can safely conclude that if we pick a height of 18.29 meters, then the car will make it through both loops. Now since we picked the minimum velocity for point B, the normal force at that point is zero. However, since the velocity at point C is greater than the minimum required velocity, we will have a normal force that is greater than zero. So let's figure that out by using the same equation of motion we used before. So this time, we have the velocity and we're trying to find the normal force. Let's solve and those are our answers. Let's take a look at this spring question. We need to find the stiffness of the inner spring so that the compression of the spring is only 0.2 meters. Let's establish the datum through the center of gravity of the box. Now we can go straight into an equation of conservation of energy. The whole system starts from rest. So the left side of our equation is zero and there is no potential energy for the box since it's on the datum. On the right side, the kinetic energy of the box is zero since it's now resting on the spring. Next, we have the gravitational potential energy of the block, which is the mass times gravity times the distance traveled. In our case, the mass is two kilograms, the acceleration due to gravity is 9.81 meters per second squared, and the distance from the initial position to the final position is 0.5 meters plus the compression of the springs, which is 0.2 meters. It's negative because it's below the datum. In other words, the work that needs to be done by weight to bring it back up to the datum is negative. We also have the elastic potential energy of the springs. Remember that both springs compress 0.2 meters, and we know that one spring has a stiffness of 400 newtons per meter, and we're trying to figure out the stiffness of the other spring. Let's solve for the stiffness of spring B, which gives us 286.7 newtons per meter. In this pulley problem, we need to determine how far block B must descend for so that block A has a speed of 3 meters per second. Our first step is to draw a datum for the pulley. We can draw it at the big pulley on the top. Note the fixed length of the middle bar, which we will label A. Now for our position coordinates. We have SA plus SB plus 2 times SA minus A, which is equal to the total length. Let's simplify it. Now let's take the time derivative of our equation to get velocity. Let's plug in the speed of A as stated in the question. This tells us that when block A has a speed of 3 meters per second, block B has a speed of 9 meters per second in the opposite direction to A. Let's think. We know for our conservation of energy equation, where we need to find the potential energy, we need to find the distance that each of the blocks move. So let's go back to our previous equation and consider a change in displacement. 
we can write that using delta. Let's isolate it for SA. Now we can apply the conservation of energy equation. We need another datum for the blocks which we will draw through the center of the blocks. This allows us to figure out the positive and negative potential energies. Initially, the system is at rest, so our initial velocities for both blocks are zero, and the displacement the blocks travel are zero. On the other side of the equation, we have half times the mass times the final velocities of each of the blocks, plus the potential energy, which is mass times the distance traveled, multiplied by the acceleration due to gravity. When we consider the distance traveled by SA, we wrote it in terms of SB. So that's what we will use in the equation since we only want one variable. Also, consider that block B is going down further away from the datum, which means the potential energy will be negative, while block A will have a positive potential energy. So just to go over that part, when block B is below the datum, to bring it back up to the datum, the work that's done by weight is negative. While for block A, to come back down to the datum, the work that's done by weight is positive. Let's solve for SB, which is the distance traveled by block B when block A reaches a speed of 3 meters per second. You can also do this without drawing another datum for the blocks and just using the datum that we established for the pulley. But I think it's harder to understand the concept at the beginning with just one datum for this problem. This should cover the types of problems you will face in this chapter. As long as you account for the initial kinetic and potential energy, and then think about the final kinetic and potential energy. The questions can be broken down to fairly easy chunks. Thanks for watching and I hope this video helped you. Best of luck with your studies.